Caitlin Clark just yesterday was named the Rookie of the Year of the Women's National Basketball Association. And that is no surprise whatsoever, of course. We all saw that coming. But what we didn't necessarily see coming is that she was not a unanimous selection. 67 votes cast for Rookie of the Year in the WNBA, and Caitlin Clark received 66 of those votes, leaving one outlier voter who voted for Angel Reese, which is absolutely ridiculous. And let's talk about how ridiculous it is. Angel Reese, again, I'm tired of saying this, she's a good player. She's a good player. Caitlin Clark is a great player. And there was no question who the better performer was during the course of this WNBA season. I mean, it's absolutely ridiculous. I might as well get a rookie of the year vote in the NBA next year because I would deserve it as much as Angel Reese deserved that vote. Caitlin Clark tweeting out to her uh, to her legion of fans that year one, check mark, thank you to the many people who have supported me as I've lived my dream. I'm filled with gratitude as I reflect on this past year of my life. See you all in year two. And that's exactly the kind of energy that Caitlin Clark seems to always bring. And it's a huge part of why we like her so much. But somebody out there had to be the turd in the punch bowl. Caitlin Clark, already a unanimous Rookie of the Year selection from the Associated Press. This is the WNBA's league award. And so somebody decided that they were going to step up and they were going to be the person who was not going to allow her to have the honor that she deserves. And I understand she's got the award one way or the other. This is far from the first award voting, Hall of Fame voting injustice that we've ever seen. I'll give you two right off the bat. When Hank Aaron became eligible for the Hall of Fame, he was the all-time home run leader. Some of us still feel like he is. Barry Bonds. We know what you did. But when Hank Aaron came on the Hall of Fame ballot, there were nine people who didn't vote for him to go into the Hall of Fame. Now, that's the old grizzled baseball writer mentality that if Babe Ruth didn't get a unanimous vote, then nobody is worthy of a unanimous vote. And there used to be an old guard at the Hall of Fame that they just weren't going to vote for you on the first ballot, no matter who you were. Willie Mays, when he went on to the Hall of Fame ballot for the first time, and I consider Willie Mays an even greater player than Hank Aaron. Some people consider Willie Mays to be the GOAT. Certainly, he's on anybody's top four or five baseball players ever. If you don't put Willie Mays in your top five, you immediately have disqualified yourself as someone that I'm going to give any credibility to your baseball opinions. Willie Mays was not voted for his first year on the Hall of Fame ballot by 23 people. 23 people. So this isn't the worst injustice that we've ever seen, but it's pretty ridiculous. Angel Reese playing for a team that went 13-27, and missed the playoffs, and their coach got fired. And she missed the last six games of the season with an injury. Caitlin Clark plays all 40 games, leads the Indiana Fever to their best record since 2015, leads the league in assists, puts up almost 20 points a game. Angel Reese shot 39% from the field, and she took 90% of her shots from inside eight feet. Okay? It's nice that she is a very good rebounder. But again, there is a good chunk of her rebounds that are her own bricks that she has laid from the paint. So whoever it is that did this, 
I hope that you at least have the courage to come out from under whatever bush it is that you're hiding in and own the fact that you voted for somebody who in no way deserved that honor just so you could make some point that you wanted to stick it to Caitlin Clark and you wanted to stick it to the people who have backed Caitlin Clark and cheered for Caitlin Clark. You're an idiot, whoever you are. I just hope that you'll come out, face the public, and let us all know your idiot identity. Ron, you have anything you want to add to this before we move to the poll of the day? You know what I find comical? That we've opened, I think we've opened every show this week with some WNBA this or that. Do you know I have literally no idea, and I am not, I'm not saying this for effect right now. I have absolutely no idea what's going on in the WNBA playoffs. I don't know who won. I don't know who lost. I don't know who's up. I don't know. I know nothing about the WNBA playoffs. The only reason they are still getting talked about on anywhere that's other than probably ESPN. It's because of this stuff. Nobody gives a flying rat's ass about that league and what happens. Harsh words from Ronnie. You called somebody an idiot. Well, you you spoke your truth. I spoke mine. The ratings have plummeted. They've plummeted, Ron. You know they haven't just dropped. It's a full on free free fall when somebody (laughs) uses the word plummet. They've plummeted. And Jamel Hill, I know one of your favorite media personalities, Jamel Hill tweeting, I keep seeing irresponsible headlines claiming the WNBA playoffs are down because of no Caitlin Clark. Would the ratings be higher if she were in it? Of course. But guess what? A finals would rate higher if it were LeBron versus Steph or if big market teams were in the mix. So what? That's the headline. So basically she's saying, yes, the ratings would be higher if Caitlin Clark was there. So why is telling the truth irresponsible? Since when did stating facts become irresponsible, Jamel Hill? Well, you know why. Don't Ricky. understand that. You, you don't you understand know that. You, you, know, you know why Jamel says anything, right? You know what she's thinking, right? Yeah, well, you know, kind of, she's, kind of her thing. She's kind of her thing. She's she's not subtle. She's yeah, not subtle kind, with kind her motives her thing. a yeah, lot of the time. Of Look, I, are, the ratings are way down without Caitlin Clark. My question is, and I don't have the answer to this, but how do they compare to what they were like last year? How do this year's playoff ratings with Caitlin gone? Did they plummet? But they're still better than they would have been or did they plummet back down to non Caitlin Clark levels before she entered the league? I think that is probably, you know, one of the more telling answers that we could get here. Well, I think, I think logic would dictate that, that the ratings are probably better now because I mean, there's going to be some contingent of people that, were unaware or didn't care at all about the WNBA before Caitlin Clark then started watching it and said, Oh, okay. And they, and they, 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 they're going to keep watching. So I would assume the ratings are better, but it would still be because Caitlin brought them to the W the regular season WNBA this year. So I would imagine that they're better than they were last year. But again, I, I don't know anybody that knows anything that's going on in the WNBA or even cares right now from a pure on the court standpoint. Well, you know, Jamel says if it was LeBron versus Steph, the ratings would be higher in the NBA finals. Look, she's right about that. Yeah. But Caitlin Clark, Caitlin Clark, she, she's LeBron and Steph and Durant and every player rolled into one. They don't they don't have an option two, three, and four in that league yet in terms of the mainstream public perception. Asia Wilson is a fine player, but she's not a household name in her own household. Give Caitlin Clark another five years 
and maybe she can build the star power up to where people will care more if Caitlin Clark isn't involved in a series. But in one year, we're not going to be there just yet. So it's however you want to spin it, Jamel Hill. But the fact is, without Caitlin Clark, the WNBA goes back to relative obscurity again until next season begins. And that's just the way it is, whether you like it or not. Facts don't have feelings. It's just the truth. And let's go now to the poll of the day over at Super 70 Sports. Oh, baby. That right there is, ain't that America? If if we had had the poll of the day, it's so American, Ron, that I feel like if it had existed in the 80s, John Mellencamp would have included a line about it in Pink Houses. <laughs> I really I really believe that. I mean, you There's could a guy it. who's got long hair making a poll of the day. I don't know, Ron. I got the singing out of the way early at least. You don't have to I didn't I didn't see that one coming, but you know, here we are. And uh, let's take a look here. It is Championship Friday, which always gives it that little extra boost of electricity. And the options this week, Monday's winner, Pearl Jam. Tuesday, we had a mini poll that was Pete Rose in or out of the Hall of Fame. And in honor of the Hit King, we're going to include him here in Championship Friday edition. We've got Mexican restaurants, which just put a hurting on the field on Wednesday and yesterday's winner, Kansas's classic carry on my wayward son. Ron, as always, I ask you which one appeals to you the most and which one do you think will win? Well, give me all the chips. So Mexican restaurant is what I picked over Pete Rose's legacy. You tortilla-loving motherfucker. Absolutely. Uh, Pete Rose, 4,256 hits, but just bring you a basket of tortillas and it it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah, had Pete Rose never got all those hits, I would be fine. I would not be fine without my uh, occasional baskets of chips and salsa. So You were a Reds fan growing up. I don't care. That meant something to you when you were, wow, like, look at that. Unapologetic. Yes. You know what? I admire yes, it. I admire yes. it. Unapologetic. Yeah. So I think Pete Rose is going to win uh, because it's uh, because of the proximity of his death. I think if you had done this poll six months from now, I don't know if it would, but I think it, that's going to, that's going to win. Um, and I don't really or know. Or six months ago. Him. Yeah. 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 You think yeah, he's going to yeah. get the, you think he's going to get the vote. sympathy vote. Sympathy vote, yeah. Sympathy sympathy vote boost. Mm -hmm. I'm torn. This one is actually really interesting to me because Pete Rose is, you know, in this poll, and I wasn't even sure if we were going to include him, and then I thought this morning, yeah, you know what, let's include him. I, boy, I think we've got a good race here. This, This one might actually be pretty close, Ron. So, producer Tim... Do what you do, my brother, and let's see what America has to say about America's Bowl. Championship Friday. No, well, I was completely wrong as usual. You were right. Pete Rose, we all feel bad that we lost the Hit King this week, and Pete Rose is, in fact, so much sympathy out there for Pete Rose right now that he beats even Mexican restaurants, Ron. I mean, I'm not surprised, but I'm I'm not going to vote because I think that's what everybody else does. I mean, I would rather have a Mexican restaurant than Pete Rose being in the Hall of Fame. So, Yeah, you're not some front runner. But, uh, you know, maybe in a way this is Pete Rose's Hall of Fame. Can Hank Aaron say that he's ever beaten Mexican restaurants in a poll? You know, the greats of the game, could they claim that? Babe Ruth never beat a Mexican restaurant. In a poll, so in in a way, perhaps this is the honor that 
Somebody it's even greater. Somebody should somebody should go Charlie onto his Hustle. Wikipedia. Somebody should go onto his Wikipedia page and and edit it and say that he actually uh, did beat Mexican restaurants in the Super Seventies Bowl. I feel like we've got at least two or three people watching this program right now that are crazy enough that they would do that. So if you do that and you send me a Wikipedia screenshot of it, I'll send you a free shirt. But just Mm -hmm. the first person that contacts me, if you can get it on Wikipedia, even for three minutes that Pete Rose beat Mexican restaurants for this honor, (laughs) I will, I will send you a free shirt, but just the first person that contacts me with proof. So there you, there you have it. Carry on my wayward son in danger of becoming the first option that doesn't reach the 10% threshold, Ron. Yeah, I, uh, oh, and there, look, it just changed. It just oh, changed. It's at, at 10.1. It's wow. at 10.1. Wow. Look at that. Yeah. That's the, that's the Mendoza line right there. 10%. If you if you're at, at least 10%, it's a weak showing, but it's at least you at least you pulled one tenth of the public. But right. if you go under 10%, that's that's a humiliation there. And I would hate to see that happen to Kansas. You know, Dust in the Wind is there. Is that, that's the only other Kansas song I know, Ron, is Dust in the Wind. Yeah, I'm sure they have others, but I I those are the only two that I know also. Well, Ron, baseball last night. Did you see Pete Alonzo? He had a three-run homer in the ninth inning to I eliminate the Milwaukee Brewers and advance the New York Mets into the National League Division Series to face the uh, Philadelphia Phillies, I believe it is. Pretty dramatic October stuff. Uh, and I love a good radio call, Ron. I know you grew up listening to baseball on the radio. So did I. Baseball is almost better on the radio, I think. A lot of us would argue. You get to paint that picture in your mind, and there's nothing like a good radio call. And let's go to the New York Mets' Howie Rose and hear how he described it last night. The Mets down 2 to nothing, top of the ninth in Milwaukee with one out. And Pete Alonzo at the plate. William sets. Here's the pitch. Swing on a fly ball to right field. Pretty well hit. Freelick back at the wall. He jumps. It's gone. He did it. He did it. Pete Alonzo with the most memorable home run of his career. Pumps his fist as he rounds second. It's a three-run homer. He's given the Mets a 3-2 to two lead. They all pour out of the dugout. Alonzo on his way to home plate. They're waiting for him. He hits the plate. He is first congratulated by Nimmo. Hugged by Lindor. There are a dozen Mets waiting for him outside the dugout. Pete Alonso keeps this fairy tale season going with the fairy tale swing of his career. Three to two New York. I am not even a Mets fan, but uh, it just gives you just gives you that little joke, doesn't it, Ronnie? Dude, he's even giving play by play of who he's hugging and high fiving and and slapping on the butt and fist bumping and man, he went all in, didn't he? He was all in. He's like, he just gave Francisco Lindor a titty twister. It's unbelievable. <laughs> I can't, I can't imagine. They actually played this on the Mets flight uh, back as a nod to Howie Rose uh, uh-huh. a- after the the win, which is which is pretty fucking cool. Now, the downside of this is when you have an October moment of jubilation like that, there's somebody who's going home disappointed and man I hate to play this one because we've talked on this show how much we love Bob Euchre who is 90 years old and still doing his thing for the Milwaukee Brewers on radio this one hurts a little bit to listen to but let's take a listen to uh, the great Bob Euchre on the Milwaukee radio broadcast Pete Alonzo's home run afterwards how he reacted Well, New York, down, they did it, and the crew will um, will have it end here tonight. 
Really a crushing end to what was a fabulous season for the Milwaukee Brewers. I'm telling you, that one had some sting on it. That one had some sting on it, says Bob Euchre, and that kind of cuts my heart out a little bit because Bob Euchre at age 90, how many more opportunities is he going to have to see the Milwaukee Brewers go deep into the playoffs or possibly make it to a World Series? So disappointment and a lot of fans today waking up, looking at a long winter and off season before the 2025 season there in Milwaukee. Yeah, it was kind of sad, wasn't it? But I've been there as a fan. I, I can feel his pain when you when you're expecting you're expecting more and it doesn't happen. You just kind of don't even know what to say. Yeah, I feel you know I feel for the closer the the guy who closes for the Milwaukee Brewers. Right, his name's Devin Williams, and he's outstanding. He's got a career ERA of one eighty three. Oh, okay, wow. that's how good this guy is. His ERA in 2023 was 153, and his ERA this year was 125. Okay, so he's basically as good as they come as a closer. And he commented after the game that he felt like everybody did their job except for him and that the loss was on him. And, of course, his teammates – um were kind to him and said, Hey, look, it's a team loss, but man, is there, is there a tougher job in sports or a lonelier position to be in than a baseball closer who came, who comes into the game and doesn't get the job done? That has yeah, got to be, well, I can that think is of a one. tough fucking job. I can think of one. Well, okay. Field goal, field goal kicker. Yeah. Not not yeah, not somebody who's coming kicker. in to try to kick a sixty yarder, but game is let's just say you know your team's down by two, no time you know one second left on the clock. Every they everybody else has done everything they could to get you there, and you come in for a I don't know forty eight yard field goal and you shank it. I can't even imagine. Like you have to make that, and you don't. That's I think that's worse than. I think that's worse than what a relief pitcher has to deal with because there's yeah, no, there's it's no, the there's be- no it's defense. The best there's parallel. no defense. Yeah. Yeah. It's the best parallel. I mean, you know, for instance, hypothetically you're one point behind in a super bowl. Oh, I don't know. Let's say super bowl 25. You come in and maybe let's say you miss it. Let's say you miss it. Maybe I don't know. Hypothetically wide, right. And let's say that it hypothetically, starts an avalanche of losses. It starts a string of <laughs> losing the Super Bowl maybe three more times. You play That'd your home games in Orchard 30 Park. Plus years later, <laughs> yeah. And there's there's guys like us thirty years later talking about it on a show. So yeah, Devin Devin Williams, I don't think has to worry about that level of. Uh, scrutiny but still a tough position to be in particularly when there's no like go get them tomorrow it's one thing if you blow a save in july and hey you know tomorrow's another day there isn't another day uh for several months now and so that's that's a hard one for devin williams to sleep on uh don't sleep on super 70 sports however because i'm tweeting over there every goddamn day and This is a little segment that we like to call What's Ricky Tweeting? And there I I am. I wish that I had those arms in real life, Ron. Let's see. What am I tweeting? This is the part where I always act like I'm stupid and don't know what I myself have done. This This is an old favorite that I can always count on for people to enjoy. Tom Brady monitored his health with a strict exercise and nutrition plan and regular advanced medical testing. Ken Stabler woke up that morning, so figured he was probably okay. Advantage, Stabler. We have come a long way in the way that athletes treat their bodies, Ron. Uh, 
just a little bit. I mean, hell, Brady, like Brady won't even eat. They're well, they're called nightshades, which I guess is a kind of classification of fruits and vegetables. Like he won't eat strawberries and tomatoes because it has some sort of a negative effect on your body. Could you imagine Ken Stabler saying, no, 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 <laughs> no nightshades for me. I didn't even know that was a thing. Like on the mm-hmm. rare occasion that I eat a fruit or vegetable, I'm not. Dis- I'm not like discriminating. You on, think like, you're doing a good ones thing. Are healthy. Yeah, you think you're yeah. doing a good thing. Like when I get yeah. the strawberries, that's like the healthiest thing I will do that month. And now you're <laughs> telling me that. Now you're telling me that like that's not even good. I, I think I have it right. I mean, somebody fact check me. I- I never, I've never heard of nightshades. I mm-hmm. thought that was like on your windows or something. You know, Ken Stabler, God bless him. He was uh, 38, 38 years old there. You know, it was just a different era. I guarantee you that Snake had more fun than Tom Brady. Tom Brady's wife was, what was she like having, having sex with her trainer or some some guy behind Tom Brady's back. Well, it was it was it was her jujitsu teacher, and it was after uh, they broke up. So let's uh, you know let's. Oh, it was. Well, uh, it was. A- are, are we sure it was after? The I rumors so. I heard is that. Yeah. Eh, I don't know. You got to watch your your wife's jujitsu teacher. Right away, that motherfucker's suspicious because he teaches jujitsu. What kind of guy? And wasn't he like from another country? I think he was. Yeah. I think, I think he was he's like Brazilian too. Yeah. Dude I think, from, yeah, I yeah. think he was Brazilian See, also. Yeah. Brazilian jiu jitsu instructor is, is, is just another way of saying, I'm going to try to fuck your wife right there. That's code <laughs> for, for that. Ron, here's one again. This is a, this is kind of an evergreen super seventies classic. This is uh John Daly. And his ex-wife, he's got several ex-wives. John Daly wrote a song called All My Exes Wear Rolexes, Ronnie. <laughs> uh, and this is this is one of his exes. And I said, one day when they finally look back and evaluate everything, pretty sure Western civilization reached its apex right here. And that would be on the 18th green of the St. Andrews Old Course. There's the, ninth, no, there's the 19th hole. Thank God that that didn't... Uh, Thank God it didn't go to a playoff is all I can say. I can't remember. I don't think it went to a playoff. Maybe it did. He beat Constantino Roca, the Italian, the fine Italian professional, to uh, win that British Open, Ronnie. And we just saw him in a Hooters this year. To me, that's the perfect follow-up to that picture. The guy in the photo there, the star, well, the star of the photo is the guy with the butt crack, I guess. But sure. John Daly, thank you. Let's get another look at the guy with the butt. If you can't find the butt crack, just look for the arrow, folks. It will it will helpfully lead you there. But yeah, John Daly in a Hooters is uh where where we where we bumped into him. Yep. In Augusta, Georgia. Yeah. While we were at what stage of our, it, what were our emotions like at that time? Had we resolved our problem at that moment or were we still yeah, you, feeling yeah. like we had just both ruined our, I can't, I can't I remember. mean, you had ruined I, your I, weekend and you had ruined my life. I think it was before. And this is funny because nobody knows what we're talking about because we've never told this story on the air. One day we will, one day we yeah. will tell the short version publicly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we got kicked out of Augusta National Country Club. We were too hot for Augusta this year. <laughs> and one day we will tell the story. We were banned temporarily Interpol. before Up it all worked Interpol. out. Yeah. <laughs> we we were on inter we definitely were. I was identified. I was identified there on the on the perimeter of the grounds. They were very con- they were very concerned. <laughs> if we had Augusta security running the border, I promise you everything would be fine. They should take over the secret service too, Ron. They should take over the country. Because they're competent, they're they efficient. The country. They're they're reasonable. I have nothing but good things to say about Augusta National and the Augusta National security team. They they were wonderful people and uh very fair and got the job done. 
Did you have fun diving into the end zone today? What? Did you have fun diving into the end yeah, zone? Yeah, I thought I was in. in. I okay. thought I was in. <laughs> you were. You were. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's the good thing about Sark is he always coaches me pretty hard. Um, you should come to a practice. It's pretty intense. Would you like so. Can you get us in, Mark? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You think you maybe should have slid on that one eight-yard carry? Yeah, I, I, my, my family's going to get mad at me for not sliding. <laughs> I think every time I call my grandfather, he says, get, uh, get down or get out of bounds. So I probably should have done that. Arch Manning, kid's got a good personality. I like him. Bright future. The NFL doesn't feel right without a Manning at quarterback somewhere, so I'm rooting for this kid to have a long and successful career. He's pretty funny, a quick wit, not unlike his uncles. And let's bring in now a man who knows more about college football than anyone that I know, not named Ronnie T-Shirts anyway. I'm speaking of OutKick's senior college football writer, the great Trey Wallace. Trey, welcome to the program, my buddy. How's it going? Man, it's good. It's good. It's been a uh, it's been a crazy man. It's been a crazy five weeks to start the season, and man, <laughs> we're only in the first month of October, the first week. So this is uh, just prepare yourself. We have three and a half more months of this. It's go- it's going to be fascinating. Yeah, just barely into October, we got a lot to look forward to. I want to ask you about UNLV, man. That. Four and zero now. They rolled. They got a game tonight against Syracuse. Is it no Sluka, no problem here? Are we just going to switch gears and the train's going? The, the Rebel train is going to keep rolling. What, what are the expectations here? Is they're going to try to slip into that college football playoff? Ricky, I, I think I think UNLV coaches are just fine. Uh, without Sluka at quarterback, uh, it's almost to a point now, you know, you go back and you think about it. It's like, man, maybe this guy should have been paying us to be at UNLV. Um, fantastic <laughs> backup quarterback who's now starting for them. And they got a big game against Syracuse, um, which I, th- I think they can win. Um, and, and they're making a, they're making their way and doing what they have to do. Barry Odom, love Barry Odom as a coach. And it, it, look, man. Things could really fall into place where UNLV is in the playoffs this year. Like I, I am not putting that past the Rebels. I had them in my uh, as the at large bid uh, this week in the poll, and I think look, I think they're just fine. I, I think they're in a better quarterback position right now than they were with Sluka. And the kid is, you know, I don't want to say him, but like you know his representation, and then you know they tried to strong arm UNLV coaches, and UNLV coaches like I. Right, Deuces, like we've seen the practice footage. We know what we have. Uh, we're not giving into this blackmail, if you want to put it that way. So, um, yeah, the the running rebels of UNLV, man, they are they are making some noise out in Vegas. Yeah, I got. They've got to feel good about things right now. No, no question. Uh, yes. Trey Lane Kiffin, uh, you, you had a great piece this week about Lane Kiffin and and Old Miss. Uh, Tough home loss last week to the Kentucky Wildcats, and you have ca- characterized their trip this week to face South Carolina as the most important game of the Lane Kiffin tenure in Oxford. What, what do we make here? I mean, we came into this season with some pretty ambitious expectations for Ole Miss. Losing to Kentucky at home was not a part of the script. What do they need to do to right this ship? and? What would a loss to South Carolina mean for Lane Kiffin and his future there in Oxford? Yeah, Ricky, I, I think, look, man, going back to that, that Kentucky loss, I mean, Kentucky is a formidable opponent, by the way. I mean, they, you know, they play good defense. The offense kind of surprised me, but that, that's not the point. Lane Kiffin has spent the last year before this season putting together this roster uh, to make a run for a national championship. And, and that's, by the way, spending a lot of money in NIL. And the fact that we did not get out of the month of September uh, without a loss for, for Ole Miss, I, I think speaks volumes. And in this trip this weekend, like, let me tell you something. If, if they were to lose to South Carolina, their playoff chances would be blown up the first week of October. And because you you can like you can talk about okay we can run the table we can beat Georgia and Oklahoma and Arkansas and Florida and Mississippi State. no 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 you lose to Kentucky and South Carolina back to back weeks I don't care really what you do the rest of the season like you're done you would have to have a lot of things play out 
with other teams losing to get in. And I, I do think it's the biggest game of Lane Kiffin's tenure. And I know there have been some monster matchups in, in his time in Oxford, and I get that. But from a standpoint of what they have on this roster and the buildup and the expectations from the folks in the Ole Miss area and the Oxford area to where we're sitting right now, where, okay, you drop the game to Kentucky but you can't turn around and drop a game to a good South Carolina team because that would really throw things into shambles for that fan base, for that football program. Um, folks would start worrying about, in my opinion, what Lane Kiffin would do after the season were to end. And so I, I, I just feel like this game is is setting up. Now, now I, I, look, I expect Ole Miss to go into South Carolina and win, but I think it's going to be a fight. And I think it is the biggest game of his tenure. I, I think there is so much – here's how I, I put it to somebody earlier in the week, Ricky. There is so much weight on Ole Miss's shoulders right now where they cannot go in and drop this game. And I, I just wonder – what that pressure is going to look like, how they're going to respond to that pressure. You know, if South Carolina gets a touchdown or two on them pretty quick, maybe in the first half, first quarter, how does Ole Miss respond? Like Lane Kiffin, this is a monster weekend for him because let's not forget, next week they go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and that is not going to be easy playing at night in Death Valley. So you better win this week. And then you got to win next week because the rest of the schedule it could be one or two losses. So it, it didn't do them any favors losing in Kentucky, man. It, it, it could come back to really bite them in the ass. Let's bring in Ronnie T-shirts right now because it's not a Trey Wallace hit on this program until Ronnie T-shirts is on the scene. So, Ronnie, you got your boy here. Ask him anything you want, my friend. Hey, Trey. Brother, it's I want to know. Speak. I want to know what you think is the best alternative college football helmet of all time, oh. and why is it what Western Kentucky is going to be wearing Thursday night against UTEP? Let me tell you something. Schools have gotten very creative over the last decade, and even before that. Like we get alternate helmets, okay, but. Nike and Adidas and all these companies really. Oh my God. God. Oh yeah. I know. I am I know. Not, I'm sorry, Trey. Oh yes. my God. Yes. I have it, never been prouder to be a hilltopper than I am right now. Let me, wow. let me tell you something. As somebody that grew up uh, in my college days of going to Western Kentucky to watch basketball games, watch football games because of the university I worked for, we were playing against them. Western Kentucky's always been fun. Like they've always just done stupid things when it comes to, you know, whether it's promoting the program or, you know, basketball and football and whatnot. This knocks it out of the park. Those are like, unfortunately we had like FIU uh, come out with these, these badass helmets because of Pitbull and the Miami vice way. But then West, you know, Western Kentucky comes out and says, Okay, I'm going to get you, FIU. We're going to come out with these crazy-looking helmets with the eyes popping out, and, and, and they're going to wear these next week. Like, this is this is what college athletics is, man. And, and I, I tip my cap to Western Kentucky for finding ways to get people more interested in their program, and that's the craziest-looking freaking helmet. It's that so, I good. Think. Like, it's Ron, so good. Ronnie, can you imagine never been lining prouder. up? On the other side of the defensive line, and all you're looking at is some freaking eyes coming out of a helmet. Like, yeah, they I, did it. They well, did I can it. I can promise you, I'm going to try. I don't know what network it's on. It's probably going to be like on CBS Sportsnet. But I'm watching yes. that UTF game next week on Thursday night. Oh, I'm stoked! Like, bring it on, man! Like those those jerseys, those helmets, man! Like, it's going to draw a lot of attention. And I I'm just praying to God. I'm just praying that we get some kind of like pick six. And then the defensive back's running down the field and he turns his helmet around and you see the eyes pointing at him. Like, that's all I'm hoping for next week. He'll probably Class get a of 2000, motherfuckers. <laughs> that's all I have to say. Class of 2000, never been prouder in my entire, entire life. Hey, Outkick fans on YouTube. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the subscribe button and make your way over to outkick.com where you can watch the full episode.